To begin with, I would really uh, thank you for having mentioned my collaboration with Larry Collins. Larry Collins is unfortunately dead now for five years. He's an American journalist with whom I spent 50 years of my life researching the world and writing books. And I think the two of us, we really were the most beautiful Franco-American combination that you can think of. Larry was from Connecticut, the son of a lawyer there. I was from Paris. As Dan told you, we met one day in the Nafi cafeteria of the Paris headquarters for NATO. We immediately fell friends, and it's true that thanks to garlic snails and really odd French dishes, I attached Larry to France. Also, thanks to the cathedrals and some of our museum, of course. And one day, you know, he came in my office there in this headquarter, and he was in tears. And I said, what's the matter with you, Larry? He says, a disaster has just happened. And I said, what is it? I've just been discharged. I said to him, I said to him you know, in the French army, when this happens to us, we open champagne. <laughs> And I understood that Larry was so sad to leave France, to go back to the United States, that I was able the next day to give him a nice piece of news. I said to him, Larry, as I'm taking you to the station where you're going to take your boat in Germany back to the States, I want to tell you that you now have a family in France. My wife has announced me this morning that she was expecting a child. Do you want to be the godfather? And strangely enough, you know, this child named Alexandra, 35 years later, lectured in this very museum because she had written a wonderful book about a great painter called Artemisia Gentileschi. So Larry knew that he was going to come back to France, and he did. Six months later, in the skin of a reporter for Newsweek, and as Dan told you, I had entered Paris Match, and here we were going to compete on the roads of the world for the big events of the news. But as competitors, this um, Larry Collins one day locked me in my bedroom in Baghdad, <laughs> So I wouldn't send the photographs of the Iraqi revolution, it was a long time ago, to Paris Match. But I was able to avenge myself a few months later by giving him a wrong train schedule <laughs> to a train leaving Djibouti, Djibouti to Addis Abeba. And I was the last journalist to be able to interview the Negus of Abyssinia, Haile Selassie. And then, you know, after all this competing on the roads of the world, one day we were spending a few days of uh, vacation on the gold golden sands of Saint-Tropez, and that's when we said to each other, but why don't we try to write a story together that would have an appeal to a Frank French public and to an Anglo-Saxon public. And that's when, in fact, we found out that Hitler had given 14 times the instruction to his commander in Paris to defend the city until the last, his last man, and to destroy it. And yet Paris had escaped from the most destructive conflict in the history of humanity without a scratch. It was a miracle. And this miracle was a Franco-American miracle because Paris, and I was in the city as a 13 years old uh, child, Paris had been liberated by 20,000 American soldiers from the 4th Infantry Division and 20,000 French so soldiers from the 2nd Armored Division. It had been the greatest day, probably, in the history of humanity, that day which had seen 4 million Parisians acclaim its liberators when 20,000 German soldiers were still in the city to defend it. To, to death, to the last man. So we said, that's the book we're going to write. And we started on a huge research of four years. Of course, I had personal memories of those times. I was there. And I remembered 
among other memories, that I had been the first in my family to hug an American soldier on the Champs-Élysées Avenue at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, that 25th of August, 1944. I had run to him. He had just come out from his tank. And I had realized, of course, running to him, that I didn't know what I was going to tell him because I didn't speak English. During the war, they had forced us to learn German. But as I arrived in front of this dusty soldier, I remembered at least one word in the language of Shakespeare. I shouted at him, corn beef. <laughs> and this American soldier exploded in laugh, went back into his tank, and came out with a box of corn beef. <laughs> And it was a royal gift at the end of the German occupation. For nine months, we had not seen meat. There was even a joke running in the streets of Paris telling that the meat ration of the Parisians had gotten to be so tiny that it could be entirely wrapped up in a subway ticket, provided that subway ticket had not been punched. <laughs> Four years later, we published his Paris Burning. And then we decided to liberate ourselves after having liberated Paris by going to Spain for a few days of vacation. And that's where one day we received a telegram from the Reader's Digest asking us to write a great story, a big story, about a man who was the incarnation of the new Spain coming out of the war. He was a bullfighter called Cordobes. But what had happened to him, to his family, to the country, had with this terrible civil war, which had really broken that beautiful land in, during three years, from 1936 to 1939, was really a beautiful new historical book that we could tell. And we started to research. Now, we had made it a rule that we would be truthful writers. So, for instance, we had really to experiment what you feel in front of a bull chasing you at 80 kilometers an hour like a locomotive. So you can experiment what fear is in the middle of a bull ring. Of course, as we, want, as we wanted that at least one survivor could write the book, we decided that only one of us would make the experiment. So we flipped a coin, and the bad luck fell on Larry Collins. And one day, a bull breeder, one of our friends, gave us in his little portable ring a bull to see what it is to be charged by a bull. Now, of course, it was not a 600 kilos Mura bull. It was more like a French poodle. <laughs> but even a French poodle charging a man with a little red cloth is so terrifying that that day, Larry Collins, I think, beat a Jesse Owens 100 meters race of the Olympics coming out of the bull ring. And we published our second book, which is called Or I'll Dress You in Mourning. And not Or I'll Dress You in the Morning, as Merv Griffin said one day on one of his shows. <laughs> and then one day, I lectured in Tel Aviv. And I decided to go and visit Jerusalem. So I took a taxi. And in that taxi, suddenly, I discovered on the side of the roads climbing to Jerusalem, it was a tiny road at the time, a cemetery of char trucks. On each of those trucks, there was a few words in Hebrew. There were some flowers. And I said to the driver, but why this Calvary on the road to Jerusalem? And he said, sir, you don't know what happened here on the night of the 24th of March, 1948. The whole city of Jerusalem was completely besieged by Arab guerrillas, and the people there, 100,000 Jews, the most sacred portion, really, of the Jewish people, were about to die of thirst and hunger. And David Ben-Gurion, who at the time was the chief of the Jewish community of Palestine, had decided to uh, mobilize a huge convoy of trucks to bring flour, water, sugar 
to the people of Jerusalem. But this convoy had fallen in an ambush. The drivers had all been killed. The, all they were transporting in the trucks had been looted. The trucks had been burned. And going to Jerusalem 24 years after those events, I said to myself, the story of that convoy is going to be the story of our new book.